Good afternoon, friends. There are still people entering from the waiting room, but in respect of your time, let me go ahead and greet you on behalf of the North Carolina Council of Churches. I am Jennifer Copeland with the council. We represent 18 denominations across North Carolina, churches large and small, urban, rural, black and brown and white. Everywhere in North Carolina, you can find a congregation that is a member of the North Carolina Council of Churches. Our work is to bring a prophetic witness to the public square and to offer an antidote to the vitriolic religious rhetoric that often dominates our landscape. And so we welcome you on this day to the launch of our 2023 Advent Guide, which we have named Embracing Equality and Inclusion. <clears throat> Why are we talking about Advent before Halloween? Have we succumbed to the consumerist culture? Not really. We are talking about Advent before Halloween to give all of you worship planners, musicians, and preachers out there a chance to incorporate this larger toolkit of equality and inclusion into your congregation's Advent plans. And to that end, we are pleased to be here today with our partners for this resource from Justice Revival. Those are two words, justice and revival, that are faith saturated. And we are claiming them to make the point about God's desire for the dignity and flourishing of each one created in God's image. With a special emphasis this year on women and the LGBTQ plus community, two groups of the human family that continue to languish under unjust practices in places where you would least expect to find it, sometimes even in our own churches. Allison McKinney Tim is the founder and executive director of Justice Revival. Her work spans the nonprofit sector, the private sector, and the academic world. In 2018, the Center for American Progress named her one of 10 faith leaders to watch. I would say, keep watching. <laughs> Allison has written for Sojourners, Christian Century, Religion News Service, and USA Today, some of my favorite, um, some of my favorite sources. She is a human rights lawyer, scholar, and faith leader with over two decades of experience defending the dignity and rights of those on the margins. She is ordained as a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church USA. Marina Grohl, the North Carolina organizer for Justice Revival, quite simply gets things done. I know this because I first met Marina when she decided that North Carolina needed a statewide acknowledgement and celebration of the centennial anniversary of women winning the right to vote. So I showed up on a Sunday afternoon for a meeting that I had very little interest in. And by the end of that meeting, I was very interested. I attended all the meetings. I hosted several of them until the celebration a year and a half later. And that my friends is the power of Marina Grohl. She's a grassroots organizer, community organizer, speaker, and writer, using her experiences to help design infrastructure for intersectional movement building, all of which focuses on preventing sex discrimination. Marina is passionate about affirming the validity of the Equal Rights Amendment to the US Constitution. She is an active United Methodist and gives credit to her parents, church family, and the women of United Women in Faith for fostering her in the ways of the beloved community. With all of that, I now turn it over to our host and good friend, Allison Tim, the director of Justice Faith Ministry, Justice Revival Ministry. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much. It is great to be with you this afternoon. Thanks everyone who's joining us. We are delighted at Justice Revival to be teaming up with the North Carolina Council of Churches in preparation for this Advent season. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the Equal Rights Amendment, about the Faith for ERA movement in support of this important justice reform. I'm going to be sharing ways that you can get involved and of course, we're going to be talking about this beautiful Advent guide that we're excited to uh, share with you today and how that can be a resource and tool to you. Um, before I delve in, I want to get a little sense of where folks are coming from 
on this particular issue. You heard uh, my colleague Marina has a lot of experience on the ERA. I see others in this audience who are fellow advocates and leaders in the movement. Hi, AJ Conroy. Good to have you with us. Uh, AJ is a key leader on the ERA in Illinois. If you've been involved in the ERA movement in the last five years, would you raise your hand either physically or virtually so I can just get a sense of sort of who's engaged on the issue? Great. Thank you. And if you are relatively fresh to the issue, if you're like, okay, I haven't been deep in the ERA for the last five years, I'm interested in learning, but I'm kind of coming to this fresh. If that's you, would you raise your hand virtually or, uh, or physically? That's great. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, super, really helpful. I just want to um, make sure I'm thinking about everyone here as I share some remarks. Um, to give you a sense of what to expect, I'm gonna to, uh, share a brief presentation with you for maybe the next 20, 25 minutes, and then it will be a time for questions and a chance to hear either your reactions or your questions we're gonna do that through the chat box. So if you have questions as you go along, please feel free to share them in the chat. We will get to as many as we can, mostly toward um, the end of our time together. Um, and please also do stay right after the event for a brief survey that's gonna pop up on your screen. Okay, with that, I'm going to share my screen and share a couple slides with you here. All right, so we're talking about embracing gender justice, gender equality, gender inclusion. As hey, part Allie, of sorry, you're, um, it's in the presenter view. I don't know if you want the audience to be able to see just your, um, the, your slide on the big screen. Oh, thanks, Ellie. Yeah, let me course correct that. We'll try again. Let's see how that is. Is that better? That's perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. So we're talking about gender, justice, equality, and inclusion. Um, this is a photo from this summer in Seneca Falls, where several hundred activists gathered to celebrate, to commemorate the 100-year anniversary of the movement, the vibrant social movement for the Equal Rights Amendment. Can you believe that it has been a hundred years and we are still in this struggle? I like to share just a little bit more about who we are at Justice Revival and how we come to um, this work of faith and justice. Justice Revival is a diverse, inclusive, ecumenical, Christian nonprofit, and our mission is focused on inspiring, educating, and mobilizing people of faith to be a voice for human rights here in the United States. We're talking about universal inherent rights, rights that belong to all of our brothers and sisters of every race and color, of every religion and creed, of every gender, expression and sexual orientation. Um, it's important to think about this in an all-inclusive way. That is the essence of human rights. And that's also the essence of neighbor love that we learn in our Christian faith. So if I were to sum up our ethos at Justice Revival, we understand that doing justice, as the Bible calls us to do, this means defending human rights. And that's how we show up to this movement. We have some brilliant examples of human rights luminaries within Christian history and tradition. We can look at the witness and example of a great many prophets, saints, who proclaimed, insisted that the dignity and worth of the human person must be respected 
here in this world, in our time and place, equality, um, equal dignity and worth, it is not only an ideal for some far off hereafter, it is very much an urgent imperative that we need to claim here and now as an expression of concern for those who suffer harm when they face injustice. When we look at this timeline, we recall Christians who fought to abolish chattel slavery, to end the torture of Native peoples in the Americas, to resist the Nazi Holocaust, to fight racial apartheid, to protect the lives of the poor, to reject Jim Crow and Jane Crow. It is a compelling truth, the truth of human equality that should guide how we treat one another and also how we structure our systems and our governments. And because I know many in North Carolina will know her well, I will mention in particular the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, that remarkable civil and human rights heroine, the lawyer, activist, scholar, poet, and priest who faced down so many forms of discrimination based on her gender, her race, her sexuality, and who played such a groundbreaking role in securing the measure of gender and racial justice that we once enjoyed in this country. And notice I say once, because the sad truth is we have slipped backwards, especially uh, in the last year under the, the current Supreme Court. But Murray's work took us to the height that we've achieved so far, and she was always very clear about recognizing the interrelated nature of all forms of oppression. And so as a church, if we are concerned with social justice, human rights, with racial justice, economic, environmental justice, we know that gender justice and equality must also be part of that picture in order to have a holistic, a comprehensive, a systematic approach to doing human rights for all people. There is so much we could say about the wisdom of scripture and how it can inform and guide the work of human rights, the work of seeking a reform like the Equal Rights Amendment. We could have a whole conversation, a whole season of conversation around this. I'll just make a few points uh, and invite you to reflect on these as you have time. One, we know we are all created in the image of God equally. We are all equally bearers of the divine image. This is the root of our, our shared dignity and worth. This is the root of our common birthright of human rights. We're called to do justice. We're called to love justice as God does. That message is so clear in the prophets. And in the Hebrew Bible, we see special attention in particular to justice for the widow and orphan. For the widow and orphan, attention to those who have not previously enjoyed the same privileges, the same rights, if you will, as the rest of the community. So there's always this attention to elevating them to a position of greater equality. And rights are a tool that we have today in our modern time that is one of the most effective and potent tools to empower those who've been marginalized and victimized, empower them to claim the respect that they are due. And lastly, we have this beautiful verse in Galatians chapter 3. We know there's no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. We all are one in Christ. This is a bold, a radical statement proclaiming an end to the, the cultural divisions that stratify humanity. And so our calling as Christians is to live more fully into this gospel and to embody it in every aspect of our lives. So what does this uh, tell us with regard to um, this particular struggle that I 
have introduced at the outset, the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, let's take a look at the ERA next. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, we've gotten some theological sort of essence of this work. Now we're going to turn our attention to this particular application. The Equal Rights Amendment, put simply, is a reform, a change to our U.S. Constitution. It's a pithy reform. This is just 24 words, the essence of the ERA, the language right here in front of you. It says quite simply, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged. It is very straightforward which is not to say that it has been easy to um, achieve the consensus needed to really respect this in practice. The ERA would ensure for the very first time in US history that women are treated as citizens of equal stature. The constitution we know is tremendously important. It's a fundamental building block of our government and laws and women were purposely excluded at the time of the nation's founding. So the ERA is a simple justice measure that's necessary to correct for that injustice. And it has tremendous symbolic and practical importance. We cannot minimize the significance of the symbolic importance. We're talking about a document that reflects and shapes the values of our democracy after all. And we're living in a time when we realize how important it is to strengthen, to support the, the values that make our democracy strong. Beyond that, the ERA also has tremendous practical importance because it provides an authoritative, a permanent constitutional standard that all government officials must respect. And that means regardless of who is in the White House, the Supreme Court, or the Congress. The ERA protects women's rights and it protects LGBTQ equality as well given recent rulings, um, in particular the, the Bostock ruling at the Supreme Court, interpreting um, a protection against sex discrimination in a way that's inclusive of LGBTQ Americans. We celebrate that. We think that's vitally important. Again, human rights by definition are universal, and so they must be all inclusive in order to be true to this ideal. The ERA, it's important to recognize, is fully ratified. So it has met the um, very high standards of Article 5 of the Constitution. It has been passed by a bipartisan supermajority of the Congress in 1972. It has now been ratified by three quarters of states as of 2020, and a number of foremost constitutional scholars have made the case that the ERA is already the 28th Amendment. It needs only to be certified and published by the executive branch, which should have happened already. And that's one of the important points that we're asking for. Decisive majority of Americans support the ERA. Most mistakenly think that it's already part of our constitution. And why wouldn't they? Most Constitutions around the world have some provision to protect women's rights or to prohibit sex discrimination. So you can see in this map, the US is among a small minority of countries, uh, just 25 countries or so that lack a safeguard uh, like the ERA. The ERA would bring the US into compliance with international human rights law, this body of law um, for the last 75 years that has called us to respect everyone's rights equally um, and that, that we've actually promised and committed to do in numerous human rights treaties. And yet we are still not living up to it as a nation state. 
So those are a number of reasons why the ERA matters deeply in principle. But how does it affect people's lives? How does it matter practically? Well, it cuts across a number of issues um, that involve pervasive and grave injustice affecting women and girls and LGBTQ Americans. I want to give you just a picture of some of the issues that make the ERA necessary, forms of injustice that our legal system has not been sufficient to address adequately. For all of these reasons, we need an equal rights amendment. I could say a lot about each of these issues. In the interest of time, what I actually wanna do instead is share with you a very quick three minute video clip that gives you a sense, a feeling for why the ERA is still so important. Um, if you bear with me just a minute, I'm gonna get that clip up. And if, if you pray, you can pray that technology works for us. Can you all see the new screen now? Yep. Okay, great. This is the trailer um, of a phenomenal film made by our friends at Equal Means Equal by the organization of the same name. This is a wonderful film. It's on Amazon Prime. Watch this brief trailer to get a sense of why the ERA matters. I ran out for the Equal Rights Amendment today. The 24-word statement pledging equality for women fell three states short of ratification. Women and men still do not have equal rights. There's no guarantee against discrimination. If we can pay a woman less than a man, then that's a huge savings to a company. We're not talking about a glass ceiling here. We're talking about a brick wall. Mothers are much less likely to be recommended for management positions. The laws that I thought were going to protect me didn't. Women are the means of reproduction. If we didn't have wombs, we would be fine. We thought that the birth control issue was settled. It is far from settled. Because our reproductive destiny is our economic destiny. It will affect our health outcomes and our economic outcomes for our, us and our children for the rest of our lives. How can it be our country has more homeless women and children than any other industrialized nation? Unless they are economically autonomous, all other aspects of empowerment will be defeated. He pulled the gun out and he held it to my throat and he told me that I was going to die that day. The police do not respond sometimes to violence against women in the same way that they respond to other crimes. And we're being arrested at greater rates than we used to be arrested for. We have something like 35% of all the female prisoners in the world. The 13-year-old child was arrested for prostitution. Rape is the most common violent crime on American college campuses today. Victims are afraid to come forward. Perpetrators know that they can get away with it. I don't know what it's going to take for people. Those are our girls. This is our country. These are our daughters. This is why it's very important for us to be aware of who our lawmakers are and how much they're prioritizing women. So that video gave you an overview of issues that I know many of you are well familiar with. And I should say again, that actually the situation has gotten more dire since this film was made because we know there was a Supreme Court ruling, Dobbs versus Jackson last summer. And I will focus on what that meant for equal protection the whole idea that women are included under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, um, which has been the result of hard-won judicial gains of the last 50 years, that whole idea came under threat with Dobbs. The whole idea of marriage equality under threat with Dobbs, same-sex relationships under threat with Dobbs. And so the, the situation is only more urgent and dire today. Um, in terms of the need for um, protections and the need for a stronger constitutional basis to fight back against 
problems like sexual and domestic violence, problems like child marriage and harmful cultural practices like female genital mutilation or cutting. My colleague Bettina Hager with the ERA Coalition testified in Geneva recently. There's a wonderful video um, on social media of her making a compelling testimony about the importance of the ERA for those issues of child marriage and FGM. And when we look at violence against women and FGM, we can see that there are important national laws on those issues that were struck down by courts, specifically because courts found that Congress did not have the constitutional authority to pass those laws. So what am I saying here? Congress needs a basis in the constitution to legislate. It doesn't have as strong of a basis as it needs in order to tackle these urgent problems of gender-based injustice. I wanna say something about the timing of the ERA and why it's urgently needed now, today. Um, and to do that, I'm, I'm actually gonna skip ahead and share with you a slide um, about the current status of the ERA. Just going back to sharing my screen here. Can everyone see this all right? I'm hoping, I'm praying. It looks good. So we already covered some of the early history. Some of you may have heard about um, the time frame that Congress associated with the ERA when it passed it, a seven-year time frame. It was extended. 1982 came and went, and 35 states had ratified the ERA, whereas 38 states are actually needed. And for some folks, this might have been the end of the story. But we know from our faith that there is always a new horizon. There is always a new possibility to do justice. And what happened um, some years ago in 2017 is we had a very special leader come to the fore to lead the great state of Nevada to become the first state to ratify the ERA in 40 years. And this started a revived movement for the ERA. Illinois and Virginia ratified. And in 2022, the ERA became the effective 28th Amendment. And um, I mention this because we actually have this very special leader with us. Uh, I see that the Reverend Dr. Pat Spearman Senator Spearman from the great state of Nevada is here with us, and I'm I'm totally putting her on the spot, but I know uh, what a powerful speaker you are, uh, Reverend Dr. Spearman. I wonder if you would say a few words to us about this cause and and why it's so important to you and what you would want this group to know in North Carolina about the ERA. So thank you, uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm I'm going to be a little bit brief. I, I chair Commerce and Labor, and I've got a committee meeting that starts in 90 seconds. Um, but I, I want to say say this about the ERA, and um, uh, Allison, I think you might have said it earlier, that when we, when we start talking about equality, that is justice work. When we talk about justice work, that is, that is biblical. It is rooted in biblical, not just theology, but it is rooted in biblical ethos. And so um, we cannot have... We cannot fulfill the call. We cannot fulfill uh, God's uh, will being done here on earth as it is in heaven until everyone has full equality. Unless all of us have it, none of us have it. And so it's very important to me um, as a black woman, um, as a woman, I've always had to struggle to make sure that I was better than um, being black and a woman. I have, I've also always had to struggle three and four times, had to be three and four times better than my male counterparts. And so when, when we start talking about equality, um, unless we have this written in the constitution, laws can be changed with succeeding legislative bodies. And that's why the ERA 
the federal ERA was very important for me to carry in. I carried it in 2015. We did not own um, either of the houses of the legislature. Uh, was reelected in 16 and brought it back in 17, and we were able to get it ratified. We ratified the federal ERA uh, during that session and also was able to get a, a pay equity bill passed uh, in that same session. Uh, one of the things that I want to lift up before I leave, though, is uh, Nevada passed last um, last year, we passed the Nevada Equal Rights Amendment. And I'd like to put that in the chat if I can. I'd like for you to take a look at it because uh, when we were uh, we were talking about it, we were discussing it on the floor before we took the vote uh, in 2017. One of my colleagues, students said, well, I don't know why we have to have a federal Equal Rights Amendment. We don't even have a state Equal Rights Amendment, so we ought to start there. And um, my, um, my desk mate at the time, who is now the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Nicole and I looked at each other and said, hmm, be careful what you wish for. And so uh, we, <laughs> I put in a, um, I sent a, um, an email to our Legislative Council Bureau and told them, I said, um, this is what we want for the state Equal Rights Amendment. And Nicole and I carried the bill. Uh, the bill itself got more votes. Uh, that, that question got more votes than any candidate on the ballot. And so that'll tell you how important um, equality is for for Nevada. Uh, let me say this too. I don't think that it's any accident that Nevada has um, has led the way, if you will, on equality. We've had a female majority since 2019, and I think we were the first female majority in the country. So uh, since 2019, we've had a female majority. This year, uh, I was appointed president pro tem, and uh, I am the first woman to hold that position in 154 years of Nevada state history. And so when I talk about equality, it's important for us, we're making in incremental steps, but it is important for us to make sure that this gets published and to make sure that everyone understands this is the law of the land. We have a constitutional right to make sure that equality across the board, regardless of sex, is 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 a part of every agenda that goes forth. It doesn't matter where whether it's in the boardroom, or it doesn't matter whether it's in church, it doesn't matter. And and having having come up, grown up in the church. Um, and I was ordained when I was 13 and I had to fight really hard. Some places wouldn't even let me in the pulpit because I was a woman. Uh, and once I, once I grew up and got a couple of alphabets behind my name and they said they didn't, uh, they, they didn't want me to uh, speak in the pulpit. I said, no problem. I'd go speak someplace else. Y'all have fun. Okay. God bless you. And so, so I understand that the church is, church is one of the uh, most pervasive, if you will, of denying equality based upon sex or gender. So this is very important, not just to me, but I think it's important to everyone. Unless all of us have equality, none of us have equality. I'll say this and then I'm done. Um, someone someone keeps saying, so when are we going to stop fighting? We will not stop fighting until done o'clock. Done o'clock. We will not stop fighting until done o'clock. When we get it done, then we stop fighting. We stop fighting that battle, but we go, we go forward with other battles because now we have to make sure hearts and minds are coming along uh, and are aboard. Because even though slavery was abolished uh, in 1863, we know that still today, we still have slavery called by different names. And so we've got to make sure that we keep going. I don't think that that soldiers that are in the fight for equality and equity, we don't retire, we refire. We're not done. We're not, we won't stop until done o'clock, period. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Dr. Senator Pat Spearman. And I'm so glad we got to hear from you. Thank you for being here. Thank I'm you. so glad folks can see why you have been at the heart of this movement. You have continued to inspire us, to move us. Um, this is a long-term effort, right? Uh, folks have been in this for a long time. This movement is a hundred years old and it is still going. And we know that that doesn't happen without deep spiritual strength. So I thank uh, Reverend Dr. Spearman for helping us to claim that spiritual strength um, and for always preaching an inspiring word. Um, we know that this is a moral cause, right? Human rights is not an issue of party politics. Human rights is an issue of our moral fiber, our moral core and our faith. And so it's particularly fitting that um, a leader like Reverend Dr. Spearman, who is an ordained minister, is a leader in this movement. 
I want to say just a couple things about faith for ERA and then open it up to your questions. Uh, I'm going to hopefully share my screen with you one more time. Uh, God willing, let's see, say helper Jesus. Can you see my screen? All righty. Um, so just a word about faith for ERA. This is a collaborative campaign that Justice Revival has led that a number of other faith groups from different traditions, national faith groups have joined and collaborated with us on. Um, and we have advocated in a number of ways seeking to elevate a voice of faith for the ERA. One of the things that has come out of this is an interfaith statement of support for the ERA. Some 600 faith leaders have already signed on. We're gonna share that statement in the chat. We hope that you will look at that, share that. If you're a faith leader of any sort, sign on to it or share it with someone that you know. That is one important way that we can um, voice our values as people of faith for the ERA. Um, and then I'll just share one more picture with you since we heard from Reverend Dr. Spearman. This is um, this summer in Seneca Falls when we gathered uh, activists at the 100 year anniversary of the ERA, recommitting ourselves. We don't retire, we refire. I love that. That's going to be my new mantra. And we kicked off this weekend there in the very same church where suffrage leader Alice Paul first unveiled the ERA 100 years ago, we kicked this off with an interfaith service of spiritual support. And so we know that it is important to renew our spirits, to be deeply grounded in our faith in order to do this work with integrity, with longevity, and with resilience. And that's part of what we seek to um, bring as faith for ERA to the broader movement. And it is a great big broad movement that we're part of. Justice Revival is a member of the ERA coalition. That's a 300 group uh, nationwide coalition, a broader coalition for the ERA. And we're partners with them um, as well as a number of other groups. And so there are a lot of ways that um, that we're advocating for this cause. A couple more quick things. Um, I promised that we wanted to share ways that you can get involved and things that you can do. Um, I wanna just mention, I hope this is showing up okay. I wanna mention our team, especially my colleague in North Carolina, Marina Grohl, who you heard introduced at the top. Marina is a tremendously talented uh, and expert organizer who has been involved in the ERA movement deeply and who knows the issue well. Um, she's gonna be sharing her contact information in the chat and she's someone who you can connect with locally um, if you're interested in um, getting involved with Faith for ERA. Here are a couple of things that anyone can do to support this cause. Um, one, there are two resolutions in the Congress to recognize the ERA as the 28th Amendment. Um, those are um, bills that you can call on your legislator to support and ask your candidates their position on the ERA. I already mentioned our interfaith statement of support I hope that you'll connect with us and follow us at Justice Revival, where we send out um, regular updates about what's happening with the ERA and calls to action for our faith allies, things that you can do um, digitally and in all sorts of ways. Please also check out um, the ERA Coalition. Um, and then I wanted to share with you some recommended resources on the ERA. Um, and by the way, uh, these slides that I've been showing you, I'm happy to share. Um, my colleague Ellie is gonna put a link in the chat and there's just a, um, 
a short little form. If you fill that out, we can send you these slides and you can have all of this information. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and um, step back and open it up to your comments and your questions. If you use the chat for that, then um, we'll, we'll elevate and respond to as many questions as we can. Ellie, feel free to ask a question whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet. Um, so we'll just give folks a minute to think. If there's any clarifying questions too that we can answer, please feel free to add those in the chat as well. In the meantime too, I'll put in the chat a PDF of the Advent Guide resource. We just wanna make sure if anyone has to leave early that you get a copy of that today. Yeah, and on the Advent Guide, I just want to reiterate, it's been such a delight to partner with the North Carolina Council of Churches. Um, we hope the guide is something that will, um, and I believe it will, um, deepen and nourish your faith and your witness for justice, and also potentially help you to start a conversation, to deepen a relationship in your community, or to you know, think with the folks on your ministry team at church or your missions team about what are ways that you might like to take action. Um, some of the things that we've offered um, from Justice Revival's side are sermons, presentations like this, and then other resources on the ERA, most of which you can find all on our website. Um, so those are some of the things we've done in the past, but we'd also love to hear from you if there are, are other things that you're looking for or ways you might imagine you'd like to see your faith community getting involved in this issue. Thanks, Allie. And I'm seeing a question from our friend Jen. She asks, how do you address the pushback that some faith leaders have saying the ERA will undermine religious freedom? Great question. Um, yeah, this is one of the objections that ERA opponents have raised. Um, one thing that I think it's always important to start with is we have an incredibly robust tradition of religious freedom under U.S. First Amendment law, and that has only gotten stronger under the Roberts Court. So there's actually a study that's found the Roberts Court um, has decided in favor of religion about, I think, 80 percent of the time, which is a marked increase from prior courts. So the trend is towards stronger support for religious expression, religious exercise. Now we know that very few rights are absolute. Often it's important to think about what are the boundaries between where one right ends and another begins. And we certainly um, prize our religious freedom and our freedom of religious expression, and yet would not want that to be used as a cudgel to prejudice or to disadvantage any vulnerable group of society. Um, I will also say <laughs> one of the main objections that's been raised in Christian tradition to the idea of rights is, oh, isn't this an idea that can be used really selfishly? Every person is, is worried about herself, himself, their own rights. And that's an interesting insight because you know, we know a lot of concepts, even important concepts, even concepts like forgiveness, they can be misused um, if they're not used in uh, a benevolent or a loving spirit. And so as a person of Christian faith who cares about human rights, the spirit that I want to exercise my religious freedom in is, yes, you know, I'm here talking about my religious beliefs but I don't want to wield that right in a way that means a person can't 
go to a doctor or go to a store or get something they need or live in a house or build a family because of their gender identity or expression, that would not feel like a loving and just um, sort of use of that privilege and that and really for Christians in this society of that power that we have being in a dominant majority. Um, let me stop there. Thanks, Ali. I also want to uplift a very kind of practical question from Barbara, who's not in North Carolina, but in New York City, and is asking about starting kind of a group or committee at her church. And so the question is, you know, what needs to happen to get the ERA published that a local group could really support? Um, you know, beyond educating, what are kind of practical ways that local individuals can get involved in this movement? That's a great question, Barbara. And you're in New York City. Phenomenal. So I know in New York, uh, there is a lot going on this year. We just heard from um, the New York-based movement, and I see AJ nodding. AJ, do you want to say something about what's happening in New York since you're the state ERA expert? No, okay. Oh, can we unmute AJ? Thank you. Um, I'll be fast. Uh, equality is spreading. And New York State is one of those places in that there is a ballot initiative to add a state equal rights amendment to New York State. So just like um, uh, Reverend Spearman was talking about in Nevada, um, New York is, is doing that now. So I'll put my contact information in there so we can, can talk because I don't want to pull away from the focus on uh, North Carolina here. But there are a gazillion things that you can do in New York and whatever state you're from, including, of course, North Carolina. Phenomenal. Thank you, AJ. Um, Allison, if I, if I may interject just a moment as well. Um, I also wanted to recognize that we have other persons in North Carolina who are deeply involved in the ERA and Jimmy Cochran Pratt and um, Harry Wally from the ERNC Alliance are guests with us today, as is Alice Crenshaw, who is the communications director with um, Equal means equal, and uh, the North Carolina co-presidents of the RNC Alliance there also have their information in chat. Phenomenal. Thank you, Marina. And I, I'm so glad everyone is with us. Do you want to say anything else, Marina, about um, folks connecting with you in North Carolina? I, I can just add by background, Marina, we're, we're so excited to have her on our team as our first in-state organizer. What else would you like to share? Um, I really love the idea that Barbara is talking about. I think that's a really solid idea in New York. And um, if you're in another state and you just need to um, make that connection with Justice Revival and we can have someone um, answer your questions directly and, and how to get things started in New York as well, if you're in another state, you can go ahead and reach out to me at marinagrawl at gmail.com um, and I'll make sure you get connected to the uh, right persons in Justice Revival. Uh, Allison and Ellie and myself will make sure that we um, are able to connect you to the people that would be able to answer your questions. So really looking forward to working with the people here that are in North Carolina as well. And um, I'm very much hoping that we'll be hearing some more kinds of ideas like the idea that Barbara is talking about, about starting a, 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 the own group there. So if you have a really uh, good idea about how to uh, work on gender equality and inclusion and how to use the Advent Guide and any other ideas that may appeal to you in order to work towards gender equality and inclusion, please share them in the chat or please reach out to us and we'll be happy to discuss those with you. Um, Justice Revival offers all kinds of programming in terms of sermons, uh, group studies, just a number of uh, programming resources. If you want to elaborate on that, Allison. Well, yes. Yeah, I think you've named it. Um, some of the key offerings that we have right now. 
um, always happy to preach or to speak or to join a panel to talk about this issue. And it can be in the context of women's rights or civil rights or human rights or faith and justice. Anytime there's an opportunity to raise awareness, um, my experience over the years has been that there are a lot of people who care deeply about this cause, but may not have realized that the movement is where it is right now, that we have this historic once in a generation, once in a century opportunity that we're right here on the precipice that literally all that needs to happen is for the president to publish this ERA to just take the final step. I mean, we've come this far. And so we are passionate about getting the word out, inviting people to connect and to be raising your voices. It's, it's important for our leaders, our lawmakers to know where we stand, to know that people are watching, to know that we realize this isn't about a time limit. That's not even the issue. I mean, this is about a fundamental issue of justice and equality. That's what's at stake here. So any opportunity to get that word out um, in our churches, in our faith communities, any opportunity to um, show at a rally, at a community event, that there are people of faith who are for gender equality. We hear way too much from those who are anti-equality. I would love to have a conversation with those folks. Let's really break it down. Let's really get into this. But it's important for our media, our leaders, our lawmakers to see there are people like Reverend Dr. Pat Spearman, people like you and me who are like, you know what? I know God has called me to love and justice. And that means Really, we all need to be included in this great democracy's historic document. Any chance that we have to share that message and to empower you to share that message in your own words, um, we're always going to be excited to do that with you. And also excited, so excited that the North Carolina Council of Churches has afforded us this uh, wonderful collaborative opportunity. So they have a tremendous amount of resources as well available. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's a great, um, just a great point to close on with gratitude for our partners at the North Carolina Council of Churches um, and this wonderful guide that they really took the laboring or in creating, designing, and that they're sharing. Um, it's been a real uh, good fortune of ours to get to work with you on this. Allie, um, do we have time for one more brief question? I think we do, yeah. Okay, there was um, kind of a practical question, follow up from Barbara, just wondering if you could explain a bit more specifically about why the ERA has not yet been published. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Virginia ratifies in 2020, becomes the 38th state, but... <laughs> Uh, just before that happens, there's an official, the U.S. archivist, the head of the National Archives, that official has the job, according to statute, of publishing amendments to the Constitution. But seeing what was coming, that official appealed to the Justice Department to advise on the ERA, and that was the um, Justice Department under the previous presidential administration. And so a Justice Department official wrote a really problematic legal memo that, long story short, discouraged and dissuaded the archivist from publishing the ERA. Um, and if you take that in, it's absolutely galling because we've had two bipartisan supermajorities, Congress, and at the state level, you've had a hundred year social movement. You have these very high bars to constitutional reform. One memo, no checks on that, you know, one memo, and that has gummed up the works. Um, and so technically, legally, that has that's what thwarted the ERA. Underneath that is the um 
opposition movement is the uh, political and religious opposition to equality that, that has fueled it. But it's that sort of procedural posture that opponents like to use as cover today for opposition to the ERA. All right. Well, Alice is raising their hand. Do we have time for comment or question? Sure. We can have a, just a, a quick, we've got just a couple minutes left. Alice, you wanna share a brief comment? Yes, yes. Um, there's been so many wonderful questions and so many great answers. And I know uh, people who are unfamiliar will probably want to look into this a little bit more when you've got time instead of just on this hour call. And one of the things we've done at Equal Means Equal is take wonderful resources from partner organizations like Sign for ERA and ERA Coalition and Justice Revival and uploaded your PDF as we speak. And we put them all in one place that you can get to with one click and you don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to sign in for anything. Um, we call it the cookbook actually modeled after um, I got the idea from going through a box of my mom's old church cookbooks where everyone would share recipes and also put their phone number and contact information in there. So it was not only a book of recipes, but kind of like a directory, right? So that's kind of one of the things we do here, finding ways to be disruptive without destructive. So this cookbook is available for everybody. It's free. All you have to do is go to equalmeansequal.org and click on the ERA Centennial tab, and you'll see an entire section of just click, download, and go resources, toolkits from other organizations, graphics, videos, how-tos, petitions, all these doc all the documents, everything. So those are all there, and... Um, we, like Justice Survival, we just try and find ways for everybody to help get in the fight. And if you're local to North Carolina, I am here for the moment. So please feel free to reach out anytime. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. Thanks for sharing that and for all your amazing work. Um, well, wonderful. We have come to the close of our hour. I'm again, really grateful for your time, for your concern for this cause. Um, I'm wishing you blessings this Advent season. I pray that this Advent guide will be new inspiration in your life and that um, God will guide your footsteps as you move from contemplation into action. For mm -hmm. anyone who would like, we're going to do a closing photo. Yes. Yeah. If we, if you want to participate, please come on camera and give us a big smile and I will take a screenshot. We'll give everyone a minute to come on camera if you'd like. Yeah. And while they're coming on, I'll just say it has been a wonderful event today. And I'm really looking forward to working with people of faith and people of conscience. So be sure to contact me at marinagrawl at gmail.com, uh, especially if you are working in a congregation and you're very interested in, in the programming that Justice Revival can provide. Really looking forward to working with you. Definitely. Thank you, Marina. All right. Three, two, one. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, it was such a gift to be with you. And as Ali has shared, we wish you just blessings on your Advent season. We look forward to staying in touch and continuing to collaborate.